Hi, everybody, and welcome to our We Move session on mental health and well being uh, in adolescents and young people. I'd like to just make some introductory remarks uh, before we open up our poll question. I'm sure I'm, I'm speaking to some very like minded colleagues out there that we're all very much um, on the same page in terms of contributing to end the neglect of young people's mental health. The pandemic has certainly highlighted the urgent need for better prevention treatment of youth anxiety and depression. Worldwide, at least 13% of people between the ages of 10 and 19 years live with a diagnosed mental health disorder. Anxiety and depression constitute more than 40% of mental health disorders in young people. But sadly, psychological distress in young people seems to be rising. I'd now like us to participate in our poll. We have two questions for you. Please visit menti.com and use the code uh, 63214039 um, to select one of two answers for the first question. Our first question is, is stigma our greatest obstacle to overcome and improve the lives of adolescents and young people living with HIV? First answer, yes, stigma is the biggest ob obstacle. The second is no, there are bigger obstacles than stigma. We do have another question for you after that one. And that is, are the barriers for adolescents and young people living with HIV to access mental health more internal or more external? Got eight votes so far. I'd really like to encourage more to go to menti.com and use the code and answer our question about whether stigma is the greatest obstacle to overcoming, to improve the lives of adolescents and young people living with HIV. Uh, the menti code is on the top of that slide, it's 63214039. You're watching the results live. Anybody else wanting, or should we be moving on to the next question? And so far we've got seven votes for yes. Oh, okay, hang on. <laughs> Nine for yes, stigma is the biggest obstacle, and 10 for no, there are bigger obstacles than stigma. Okay, any last, last chances with this one before we move on to the next question? Seems very neck and neck at the moment. Right, question number two. Are the barriers for adolescents and young people living with HIV to access mental health care more internal 
or external. So there are three options here. The first being mostly internal, next mostly internal, external, and both. Okay. <laughs> Right, so both equally definitely seems to be coming up tops. Thanks everybody for participating. I'd like to move on to introducing our first speaker, Dr. Arvind Banner, who is Chief Specialist Scientist at the South African Medical Research Council an honorary associate professor of psychology at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. His research focuses on understanding risk and resilience, adolescent risk-taking behavior, substance use, and mental health. He has been the principal investigator or co-investigator of several NIH-funded research projects in South Africa, supporting perinatally HIV-infected youth. His recent publications examine the role of family protective factors in improving mental health and behavioral outcomes and reducing the risk of STIs among children and youth. Additionally, his publications focus on public health interventions for depression using task sharing in developing country contexts and brief interventions for alcohol use in public health facilities. Welcome, Dr. Arvind Banner, and we look forward to your talk. Good afternoon. I want to thank the Desmond Tutu Foundation for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this afternoon about research related to interventions that address the mental health of adolescents and young people living with HIV in low and middle income contexts. As a broad overview, my presentation today will cover mental health issues in non-HIV populations because it serves as a useful basis for comparison. And of course, one cannot discuss mental health currently without taking account of the impact of COVID-19 on mental health. I then discuss mental health among adolescents and young adults living with HIV and adolescents and young ad adults affected by HIV and why the mental health is of and should be of concern to all of us. This is followed by a high level overview of the evidence that relates to the interventions that address mental health, specifically among adolescents and young adults living with HIV and affected by HIV. And finally, I take a look at what underpins much of the intervention work, if you want the mechanisms of change, which will hopefully guide mental health interventions in these populations. So to begin with, uh, mental health in non-HIV populations shows that worldwide, about 13% of young people between 10 and 19 live with a diagnosed mental health disorder. Anxiety and depression make up more than 40% of mental health disorders worldwide. Suicide is the fourth most common cause of death, preceded by road injuries, tuberculosis, interpersonal violence. Uh, among adolescents in this age group. 
And in a review of 42 studies, uh, anxiety and depression were the most common psychiatric disorders in sub-Saharan Africa. In relation to COVID, the startling findings by the review undertaken by Santo Moro and colleagues in the recent Lancet article indicates the percentage change globally in Sub-Saharan Africa and in South Africa of major depressive disorders and anxiety disorders. And it is plain to see that there's been a substantial increase in the number of major depressive disorders globally and in Sub-Saharan Africa. What is remarkable is the extent to which this percentage change has impacted on South Africa from a baseline of 19.2%, 22, 22%, a uh, percentage change of almost 39% uh, is evident. And in terms of anxiety disorders, this is at the level of about 36%. And more remarkably is the fact that these changes have affected largely females and a younger age group. So clearly there's, there's much that one needs to take account of in relation to mental health, not only about, among uh, adolescents living with and affected by HIV, but among all adolescents and young adults. So what do we know about mental health of uh, adolescents and young adults living with HIV or affected by HIV? including those perinatally HIV exposed but uninfected. Well, they share many of the same psychosocial and contextual vulnerabilities. The evidence suggests that those affected are at increased risk for mental health problems and possibly even greater risk than those living with HIV. Nevertheless, what is clear is that both groups have high rates of mental health problems. Uh, higher rates, rather, than of mental health problems in the general population, which is exacerbated by adverse environments, including poverty, violence, discrimination, familial substance abuse, or mental illness. And typically, one would find that the mental health problems identified in these groups include depression, severe anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, internalized stigma, suicidal ideation, substance misuse. Now, it's true that the extent, the extensive physical, hormonal, neurocognitive, and psychosocial changes is common to all adolescents and young adults. Nevertheless, uh, adolescents and young adults living with HIV and affected by HIV have unique challenges. Uh, they have the added challenge of managing a chronic lifelong condition that is stigmatized and can have significant neurological effects. Untreated mental health problems increase the risk of non-adherence to antiretroviral treatment and increase sexual and substance abuse risk behaviors. More importantly, when we note, we note that more than 50% of adult mental health disorders appear before the age of 14 years, thereby making it important to address mental health problems early in the lives of adolescents. Fewer trials have indeed focused on mental health needs of adolescents and adults, young adults living with HIV and affected by HIV in low and middle income countries. Nevertheless, this has been made in evidence-based mental health for adolescents and young adults in the general population, which could serve as the basis for our understanding of these interventions. Typically, what has been used is cognitive behavior therapy or CBT, interpersonal psychotherapy or IPT, dialectical behavior therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. All of these have been evaluated in multiple trials, multiple contexts, but mostly in resource-rich countries with professional therapists. What I've done is I've categorized the evidence linked or related to low resource contexts that address mental health of adolescents and young adults living with HIV or affected by HIV specifically. So to begin with, um, individual mental health treatment interventions 
I typically use a, a CBT and or may, may use elements of CBT, such as problem solving, behavioral activation, or cognitive restructuring, emotional regulation, assertiveness and relaxation training. And trained professionals would usually facilitate the intervention. Of course, this uh, limits its feasibility due to the low number of trained professionals to meet the demand. Further, it's unclear which elements in the intervention that is being applied are contributing to its efficacy. Usually outcomes uh, that are focused upon when individual mental health treatment interventions are mounted uh, is depression, anxiety, self-esteem, and adherence outcomes. A second class of interventions focus on group and family strengthening. And their, their attempt is to promote mental health improvement and improve parent-child relationships through family group-based interventions. It has a strong psychoeducational focus, uh, not unusually so, with elements of problem solving and cognitive behavior therapy. Again, it's unclear which of these elements are contributing to its efficacy. Nevertheless, uh, these uh, interventions typically focus on improving depression, reducing anxiety, uh, internalized and externalized stigma, adherence, self-esteem, emotional and behavioral problems. A third class of interventions is family strengthening interventions that have an economic component. And the economic component uh, appears to promote, uh, uh, appears to address issues of access because of poverty. And we are aware of the links between poverty and um, mental health. So uh, these particular uh, groups of studies have shown lower hopelessness and depression scores, improved self-concept, reduced sexual risk behaviors, and have promoted emotional well-being and are usefully also delivered by lay counselors. A fourth class of interventions are mindfulness-based interventions. They're either group-based or stress reduction interventions. And they seek improvement in mindfulness, problem solving, coping styles, life satisfaction, and seek to reduce aggression again, delivered by skilled mindfulness instructors. So training, uh, training is required to deliver these particular types of interventions. Community-based interventions, unfortunately, have unlimited and there's weak evidence of its efficacy. Uh, nevertheless, the limited evidence shows some, in, some psychological, can increase psychological well-being, lower stigma, and improve, improve uh, adherence. Now, one of the things that um, is uh, one has to take account of is that while most of these interventions that I've just described have used randomized control trials, and ex but ex extracting what works for whom and under what conditions is difficult. Exactly because the intervention models are adapted and use selected components of interventions. The outcome measures are often self-reports of adapted measures with most not being validated for the target population. Implementation of the intervention ranges from skilled professionals to trained lay health workers with and without previous experience. And training models uh, involving lay health workers Because have varying levels of training and supervision, which are often not well documented. So there are um, real issues with the quality of evidence uh, that we have. So one of the issues that I think is important to consider, given the, the state of the evidence, is to look at the active ingredients a look under the hood, as I call it. And uh, I will talk about five particular uh, characteristics, dimensions, or actions. The first would be is emotional regulation, 
followed by decentering, problem solving training, interpersonal psychotherapy, and behavioral activation as uh, important ingredients for any uh, meaningful intervention. So, taking a look at emotional regulation skills, we first focus on what I refer to as engagement emotional regulation skills or engagement ER skills. And they comprise three specific categories uh, cognitive re reappraisal, which is um, seeks to generate positive or neutral reinterpretations of a stressful situation. Comments typically would be, it isn't real, does not affect me, it'll get better over time. A second component is acceptance. And mindfulness and acceptance are actually overlapping terms. It describes two beneficial processes, present moment awareness and non-judgmental acceptance of feelings and emotional states. And the third component involves two cognitive processes, generating potential effective solutions, and secondly, attempts to discover effective solutions or ways of coping with problem situations. In a similar vein, we also have disengagement emotional regulation skills, which comprise also comprise three components. Avoidance, is a generalized unwillingness to experience negative emotions along with related physical sensations and thoughts. It can be physical avoidance, experiential avoidance, or suppression of a range of thoughts, emotions, sensations, memories, and urges. Depression, on the other hand, attempts to decrease the overt expression of an emotional response, such as distracting oneself from thoughts and feelings. And the third category is rumination. This is a repetitive thinking that causes and consequences of emotional experiences um, uh, that prevent active problem solving to change circumstances surrounding these symptoms. And in a meta analysis of the emotional regulation literature, uh, comprising a, a slew of uh, RCTs of psychological intervention for and anxiety symptoms and using ER as an outcome measure. These studies, this meta-analysis showed that psychological treatments that involve an element of ER significantly reduce depression, anxiety, and emotional dysregulation and disengagement and increased emotional regulation. Indeed, improvements in depression and anxiety are positively associated with improved ER skills. So the better you are at the skills that I've just described, the, the greater the, the level of managing depression and anxiety. And these skills reduce emotional dysregulation and reduce disengagement ER skills. It is also found in this meta-analysis that longer treatments, group format, which I think is particularly useful uh, given its uh, efficiency, and cognitive behavioral orientations produce larger positive associations between improved ER skills and reduced symptoms. And most of the uh, approaches that have used uh, emotional regulation in their training here are cognitive training, like the, such as CBM and ABM, or cognitive behavior therapy, or cognitive behavior therapy based approaches, such as problem solving training, interpersonal therapy acceptance and emotional regulation-based therapies, and mindfulness-based therapies. And we'll note that the interventions I described earlier all use elements of these in one way or another without actually specifying the particular uh, mechanism of change. Decentering another cognitive approach is the ability to observe thoughts, feelings as temporary events rather than true re reflections of reality itself. And what it does is it dampens the impact and distress associated with psychological stresses that can otherwise increase mental ill health in vulnerable individuals. And it flags as a core component in treatment and prevention, uh, it is flagged as a core component of uh, in treatment and prevention of anxiety and depression and operates on a continuum from a low to a high end. 
at the lower end of decentering ability in a very precise models of the real world, thereby increasing anxiety. At the higher end, one is likely to disengage from negative content and self-distancing language increased in those actively attempting to downregulate emotional response. Decentering has been found to have medium to large effects following cognitive behavior therapy, mindfulness-based interventions, acceptance-based therapies. So this is another construct that one can actually try and measure to determine uh, change uh, in relation to the intervention that is being used. Problem solving training focuses on promoting an optimistic and self confident attitude towards problems, positive problem orientation, and to internalize four core problem solving skills defining the problem, brainstorming possible solutions, appraising solutions and choosing the most appropriate one, and implementing the preferred solution. And hopefully, there will be some reflection on the outcome. Problem-solving training as a standalone intervention is scarce and evidence suggests that it may enhance treatment response in CBT. It may also be useful as a low-intensity intervention in low-resource contexts. Interpersonal psychotherapy, or IPTA, is focused on the negative interpersonal experiences and social context of adolescents. It seeks to address loneliness, low self-worth, social withdrawal, low self-confidence, and seeks to improve and strengthen links with social environments to break the negative cycle. Meta-analytic reviews have found large effects in reducing depressive, depression symptoms and attachment anxiety using IPT. It's also well liked by youth because of its relevance to the issues and its focus on interpersonal experiences and social context and may work well within school and internet-based approaches. What is unclear is if improving social relationships is protective against depression, irrespective of the causes. The last uh, mechanism uh, underlying change that I want to refer to is behavioral activation. It's a non-cognitive focus on overt behaviors that systematically increase individuals' engagement in pleasurable activities which include personally meaningful and valued activities. Behavioral activation involves generating a list of pleasurable activities, engaging in these activities as per schedule, and monitoring its impact on mood. Skill tra skills training elements in behavioral activation may include problem solving, social skills, communication, and assertiveness skills. It has been found that it has limited evidence for efficacy around anxiety. In conclusion, it's clear that no one mechanism of change can be uh, used as being the sole arbitrator of change in all interventions. So one size does not fit all. Evidence-based interventions should be tailored according to the needs of the adolescent group one is working with, keeping in mind the principles underpinning the interventions that one seeks to do, undertake. Youth voice is, of course, important in determining what these elements should be. And depending, of course, on the availability of the resources and experts uh, that are context specific. Fewer resources may mean the use of approaches such as problem solving or behavioral activation that may be less demanding on training and other resources. And systemic interventions have a particular appeal because they target all adolescents and young adults, and it's more likely to provide continuity of care, uh, such as upward referral, reduce stigmatization, and potentially increase sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banner, for a brilliant talk. And uh, I particularly enjoyed uh, how you conceptualize the kind of core ingredients cutting across all therapies. Um, 
yeah, it's incredibly useful. I think the, the positives are, is that we do have treatments that work. The difficulty of course, is that it is, in, is that we lack mental health professionals, particularly in low uh, middle income countries. So um, I've, I recently had a look at the WHO stats for number of psychiatrists per 100,000 population. Uh, the United States has about 16 psychiatrists per 100,000 population, while Africa, they've just those lumped us all together in one continent, um, is unfortunately only has about 0 0.9. That's less than one uh, psychiatrist per 100,000 uh, population. So good news is we have fabulous treatments that, that really work. Um, the difficulty, of course, is that we are, particularly in areas where HIV is endemic, lacking um, mental health professionals, um, significantly lacking mental health professionals. So uh, next we're gonna be moving on uh, to some entertainment. Uh, we have a video of a song um, from Africa uh, Zvandiri. Um, I'd like to uh, just take some time to, uh, to introduce um, one of the singers, uh, Vimbanashi Jazi. Uh, who will be talking about uh, their song and um, yeah so thank you very much thank you we look forward to it uh, thank you very much uh, for having me here it is really an exciting moment to be introducing one of the projects that we did as young people in Shandiri um celebrating ourselves as young people so in 2017 uh the musical film uh the greatest showman was enjoyed by audiences all around the world the film include the song this is me which was performed by a group of people who have been stigmatized and isolated from society in this song they fight back saying i am bruised i am battered but i won't let that get me down because i am glorious which means this is me the song This Is Me resonates so closely with our life experiences as young people from Zimbabwe whose life have been changed by HIV. Um, we have faced so many challenges <clears throat> growing up, challenges such as stigma, isolation, hopelessness, and fear for our future. But we have learned to cope, love, and accept ourselves as we are. And this is us. So in 2019, with the generous uh, permission of the original writers and Cobalt and Fox Music, we covered the song in our own unique uh, Zimbabwean Jandiri way. We came together as a group uh, of young people from Jandiri program in Zimbabwe with support from other local singers, dancers and artists. Uh, just so you can get uh, the meaning of Jandiri, it means as I am, uh, which is this is me. We had never sang before, we had never danced, we had never even performed before, but we auditioned and we were selected to be part of this great production. So I just want you, uh, when you are watching this, to enjoy it the same way that we enjoy once we were recording it. So I would like you to enjoy as we celebrate who we are. Thank you. Indeed. 
stranger to the dark Hide away, they say Cause we don't want your broken past Broken Learn to be ashamed of all my scars Run away, they say No one will love you as you are but I won't let them break me down to dust I know that there's a place for us For oh, we are glorious When the sharpest words wanna cut me down I'm gonna stand apart, gonna drown them out I am brave, I am bruised I am who I'm meant to be This is me, look out, cause here I come Mbanati and your fellow warriors, thank you for sharing your journey with us. That was absolutely beautiful and what a perfect song. Such powerful and absolutely magnificent lyrics. Uh, thank you so much. It's been very privileged for you to have shared that with us. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Nicola Willis. Nicola Willis is the founder and executive director of John Deary, based in Zimbabwe. She trained as a pediatric adolescent HIV specialist nurse in the UK before 
working in Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, and Zimbabwe, assisting government, health facilities, and communities to establish pediatric and adolescent HIV treatment, care, and support services. She is the founding director of Jwandiri program in Zimbabwe, which has now evolved to a national evidence-based model of peer-led differentiated service delivery for children, adolescents, and young people with HIV. She is particularly interested in the mental health needs of children and adolescents living with HIV and has participated in a number of global consultation meetings on adolescents living with HIV. She is a member of the World Health Organization's HIV Guidelines Development Group and co-chair of the WHO's Adolescent Service Delivery Working Group. Welcome, Nicola. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. I'm going to talk about Jandiri. Jandiri literally means as I am. This name was chosen by adolescents living with HIV in Zimbabwe back in 2004. They wanted to say, I may be HIV positive, but accept me as I am. They told us they wanted more than the medicines if they were to thrive as young people living with HIV. And this was very much the foundation and beginnings of Jandiri, an evidence-based peer-led approach to integrating pediatric and adolescent HIV and mental health services. I want to start by showing you this painting, a self-portrait painted by a young lady named Rudo. Rudo is 17 years old, living with HIV and diagnosed with severe depression. She painted this during a research study which utilised body mapping to explore the experiences of HIV positive adolescents with mental health conditions. When I asked her to tell me more about her painting, she said, this is me. My parents died when I was young. My uncle raped me repeatedly. I moved to another family where I was raped again. Now I have HIV, no one wants me. I have no idea if I will ever marry or have a family of my own or how long I will live. I painted myself black because after everything that has happened to me in my life, I am dead inside. You may see me smiling, but this painting here shows how I really feel. When I asked her about the red paint she had used, she said, this is my heart beginning to warm up because now I have met other young people like me at Shandiri. And this is what I'm going to talk about, how Shandiri promotes the mental health of adolescents living with HIV and ensures identification and management for those at risk or diagnosed with mental health conditions. I'll start by just mentioning how common mental health conditions are among adolescents living with HIV. Until fairly recently, most of the research investigating the relationship between mental health and HIV among adolescents has been conducted in high income, high income countries, but this is really changing. As you can see from just a few studies mentioned here, there are a range of estimates, but they all demonstrate a high prevalence of common mental disorders among adolescents living with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa. The design and evolution of Jandiri over the years has been informed by evidence, beginning with young people in 2004, who, as I said, told us they would need more than the medicines. This was then followed by a series of research studies and use of program data. This data has confirmed the high prevalence of poor mental health among adolescents living with HIV, and that this correlates with poor adherence to art. Our research confirms adolescents living with HIV attribute their high viral load to poor mental health, in turn is due to the negative relationships in their lives, particularly with their caregivers, peers, and healthcare workers. They also tell us that poor adherence to art is in fact a form of slow suicide to them. They tell us cats are critical in reducing poor mental health. We've also heard from healthcare workers that they lack confidence in managing the mental health needs of adolescents living with HIV. And recently in 2020, we found that 35% of adolescents living with HIV with symptoms of common mental disorder had a high viral load. 
In October 2020, on behalf of the World Health Organization, we led a global consultation with almost 400 young people across 45 countries, which confirm the above, that psychosocial support and mental health services are critical in improving HIV outcomes among adolescents, particularly if those services are led by peers. This and evidence from the Jandiri trial, along with other studies, directly contributed to the new WHO guideline recommending that all countries adopt psychosocial support and mental health services within HIV service delivery for adolescents. Jandiri, I've explained that it integrates HIV and mental health services for children, adolescents and young people living with HIV. But at the forefront of this work are trained, mentored peer counsellors living with HIV. Jandiri positions HIV testing, treatment, care and support within a framework of peer-led, holistic, psychosocial support and mental health, recognising that we need to address both the HIV care and treatment and mental health and psychological well-being of young people. The peer counsellors are called Community Adolescent Treatment Supporters, or CATS. CATS that become mothers then work specifically with pregnant and breastfeeding adolescent girls and young women as young mental mothers. Both CADAs, the CATS and YMMs, are embedded within the health facilities and support caseloads of children, adolescents and young people across the clinic, community and through digital platforms. They provide counselling and support for their clients, identify health, psychosocial and protection needs and ensure they are linked to the services they need, as, as well as supporting the caregivers and families of their clients. CATS and YMMs have been adopted and scaled by the Ministry of Health and Child Care and National AIDS Council throughout Zimbabwe with support from our partners. And there are currently 1,600 CATS and YMMs supporting 62,000 children, adolescents and young people living with HIV in Zimbabwe. CATS has been adopted or adapted in 10 countries in the region with technical assistance from Jandiri. We've conducted various research studies, including three randomized control trials, which confirm Jandiri is an effective peer-led DSD model, resulting in improved uptake of H HIV testing services, art initiation, retention and adherence and viral suppression, but also mental health among adolescents living with HIV compared with standard care. These are all published and available on the link at the top. Here I'll specifically highlight the recent Jandiri Friendship Bench trial. With this trial, we wanted to explore what effect CATS counselling has on mental health conditions among adolescents living with HIV. And more specifically to ask what would happen if we enhanced CATS counselling by training them in problem solving therapy led by Friendship Bench. So 840 adolescents living with HIV across 10 districts of Zimbabwe were randomised to receive either standard CATS counselling or enhanced CATS counselling. You can see that both arms had significant improvements. Among adolescents living with HIV receiving the standard CATS counselling, symptoms of common mental disorder reduced from 72 to 10%. Among those receiving enhanced CATS counselling with the problem solving therapy, common mental disorder or symptoms of common mental disorder reduced from 68 to 2%. What we found in the intervention arm from our qualitative data showed that CATS in fact adapted problem solving therapy to more of problem discussion therapy and that this was highly effective. Here are some program results from 2020 to 2021 um, showing that during this period 62,000 children, adolescents and young people living with HIV received sustained counselling and support from CATS. Where this couldn't be provided in person due to COVID and lockdown and social distancing, this was provided virtually by CATS for those that could be reached by phone or through targeted outreach visits that, that didn't have phone, didn't have a phone or couldn't be reached. CATS screened 34,783 clients for common mental disorders. 18% were found to be at risk and referred for further management, as well as continued counselling from CATS. So we know peers are wanted by adolescents and we know that they are effective. What are when engaging peer counsellors in the provision of mental health services? We've explored the experiences of CATS in this role 
and come up with this trust framework, which was work led by Carol Wogren and Sarah Bernays. I don't have time to go into detail, but the key aspects of it are that cats need effective training so that they are equipped with the skills and competences needed to provide effective child But it doesn't stop there. They need to know how to refer and to have very clear referral pathways for complex cases. This can, of course, be challenging when there is a lack of trained mental health cadres to refer to. They need to understand the remit of their role, which is focused on creating a space for young people to talk and in identifying those where more support might be needed through referral pathways. They need ongoing supervision and mentorship, and this really is of the success of the CATS programme as we found it. We set young people up to fail if the training is adequate for them to effectively support their peers and contribute to improve HIV and mental health outcomes. Supervision and mentorship is critical to enable CATS to fulfil their roles, but also to support and wellbeing. And finally, they need to know and understand that many of the challenges faced by young people are complex and often require additional support from adult professionals across different sectors. And that even if problems can't be solved on their own without additional support, that problem discussion therapy is of enormous value for young people. Jandiri has used what young people are telling us, and, and we've worked with Ministry of Health and Childcare to develop a range of training curricula and implementation tools to support the delivery of services which support the mental health needs of young people. This includes screening tools, uh, training curricula for healthcare workers, cats and young mental mothers, counselling tools, books and comics, fact sheets, animations and support group curricula. Most of these are available on our website, which I'll share at the end. And the Ministry of Health and Childcare and Jandiri have focused on capacity building to support the psychosocial support and mental health needs of children and adolescents living with HIV. This is focused on equipping healthcare workers with the skills and competencies to counsel children and adolescents living with HIV, to screen for mental health conditions, then provide, then provide appropriate support, including referral to mental health cadres. And we work with families to promote mental health literacy and support and ensure continued capacity building for cats and young mental mothers. So to close, I'd like to thank our Ministry of Health and Childcare, our National AIDS Council, and our technical and funding partners. But of course, to thank the many extraordinary young people at the forefront of all this work, who continue to remind us of the tremendous capacity and role they have to play in improving the lives of their peers living with HIV. We continue to learn from them about what young people need and how we can best be responsive to those needs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nicola, for sharing a, an obviously meaningful and helpful mental health intervention, uh, which certainly goes a long way to solving our massive problem of having less than one psychiatrist per 100,000 population, and also really address, addresses the importance of, of that core ingredient of, of what therapy does in order to help people heal from their mental health symptoms or mental health di disorders. And that's a feeling of connection that, that perhaps, perhaps the, mo the thread that is most common across all mental health interventions is relational. It's, it's about providing a space uh, for young people to feel accepted, um, valued, respected, and listened to. And, and also for highlighting uh, the importance that, that it does not have to be a psychiatrist uh, doing that. Um, that. That this is something that, that, that many people who are psychologically minded, uh, not necessarily ever having had mental health training, can provide young people with. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we're now going to be uh, moving on to our question and answer session. Uh, with our two speakers, Arvine and Nicola, uh, but also with 
our two panelists who I would like to introduce. First is Philip uh, Kroniski. Philip Kroniski is an assistant professor of clinical medical psychology at Columbia University's Irving Medical Center. He concentrates on the impact of socioeconomic factors and digital technology on adolescent and young adult development in the US and Sub-Saharan Africa. He also designed and teaches the course Digital Technology and Human Development in the Hillebrum Department of Population and Family Health in the Mailman School of Public Health. Our second panelist is Claire van der Vestazen. Claire van der Vestazen is a medical doctor by training who during her PhD realized that public mental health research is the perfect combination of interacting with people writing and playing with data. She's a senior lecturer, researcher and course con convener for the MPhil in public mental health at the Alan J. Fisher Center for Public Mental Health. Claire enjoys engaging with people around the world and supervising postgraduate students as they discover the exciting world of research. Her research interests include adolescent mental health, injury prevention, and exploring solutions for improving mental health in South Africa, particularly in the form of brief counseling interventions and implementation strategies to make these interventions accessible. I'd like to encourage people to pop their questions into the chat box, and particularly if you, if you have a, a question for um, any one of the speakers in particular. I see Desmond Tutu is also saying, please, you can also just raise your hand if, you, if you'd like to ask a question directly and not through the chat box. I don't see any questions being posted yet. So perhaps I uh, could ask um, Claire and uh, and uh, Philip for their for their comments. Um, and then again, I see you've just raised your hand now, but uh, I, I don't know if uh, if Claire or if Philip would like to add uh, any comments or perhaps some observations from uh, the two talks uh, this afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're at. Um, yeah, thanks, Jackie. I'll chip in. It's really wow, two amazing talks. I mean. Irene, you gave such an amazing overview and it, it was great to see it packaged like that in kind of a accessible um, piece. And Nicola, and the work you, you guys are doing is really fantastic. And I really love the way that you involve adolescents in every aspect um, of your work from delivering services and also um, with materials and resources. So I was just wondering how you, is there any sort of methodological approach or any tips for people about involving adolescents and developing materials and service. I just think you've obviously got so much experience in this. Um, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Claire. Um, and thanks everyone for the opportunity to, to talk today. Um, I'm sure I should have a really clever response to, to the methodology, um, but I think for all of us that work with youth, um, you, you'll appreciate me saying, it. I think we have some core principles, of course, um, around, I'd say first around safety, actually, ensuring that whatever approach we use or whatever method we use is safe for young people, that they really understand what they're engaging in. Um, Vimbai is fabulous. She makes it easy talking in these sort of global webinars and being on film, but of course, not everyone is, is Vimbai. Um, and may want to be involved and engaged, but not want to openly disclose their status. So we, I think safety um, and the ethics, even though it might not be formal research, the principles of ethics um, are cross-cutting in whenever we engage in these processes. Um, and then just, again, it's just really, really believing in that process and, and um, you know, putting our thoughts aside and, and, and hearing from young people about what they want. A lot of the um, approaches or tools or resources we develop aren't necessarily heavily resourced or financed. And I think that's another thing. They don't necessarily have to be 
um, big, expensive um, processes. And actually, often the more sim the simpler they are, that's where we get the richest um, work and, and uh, most value from what we're doing. And, and, and equally in research as well. And it was actually, Claire, with your department where, you know, we were doing body mapping and our research was with young people um, literally using paper and paints. And so I think, yeah, I would just stick with, don't feel it has to be fancy. And, and often for, for us, it's been the, the most valuable. I hope that helps a bit. Great, thanks, Nicola. Uh, Philip, do you wanna make a comment? Otherwise, Linda Gale you, has got her hand raised. I see you've also posted a question in the chat box. Uh, Linda Gale, do you, want, do you want to ask your question or would you like me to read out what you've got in the chat box? Okay, right, uh, I'm going to read the question. Any potential harms in task shifting down to peers or near peers in particular, in terms of working on mental health issues? And she also goes on to say brilliant talk, thanks. Uh, Linda Gale says she can't unmute. Um, let, let, me, let me try and sort of uh, address that. There were two questions. I thought there was one question that came up. Someone asked the question about the first step in improving mental health of young people. Um, there is no real cookbook around that, except that it's important that one destigmatizes the notion of help seeking. That mental health is commonly experienced by people, regardless of whether they have uh, HIV or they do not. And second, that help is available, or can be made available. So I think it's about pr promoting a positive message that you're not alone. Um, I think in relation to the question around, um, is, there, is there some harm in relation to uh, downstepping, if you want, to pass sharing? Yes, there can be. Uh, the issue is really about training and supervision. I mean, every every uh, uh, every piece of work that you that one has read about or reviewed that is one read about what is effective in task sharing is the fact that there must be uh, really good training and uh, continuous support uh, and supervision of those people doing task sharing. It really is not meant to be simply, let's shift the burden to someone else. That would be entirely the wrong message that you're providing. So it is about uh, extending the scale of the effort. And I think uh, Zwandiri, and in fact, uh, you'd be interested to know, Nicola, that the, uh, that was the one community uh, focused uh, effort that I referred to in my review uh, called CATS. Uh, so people can read more about that. But it is about uh, ensuring that the, the service that is provided or the level of care that is provided is um, well-structured and well-trained. I think the second issue one has to keep in mind is that there has to be a referral pathways. It is not the case that everybody has the same level of mental health issues, that there are some very complex issues. And the more complex the history of the person in terms of some of the initial uh, footage we saw of that great video, um, that's not going to, task sharing is probably not going to help uh, resolve that issue, would re require someone with much greater skill. So one has to keep that in mind. But we're talking about trying to reach many people with the least amount of resources. Thanks. Uh, Nicholas, see, I see you have your hand up. Well, Arvind's made it very easy for me, but I just wanted to completely agree. And just to share, I, th I think it's really worried, concerning. On the one hand, we, we are absolutely you know, passionate believers in the power of task shifting to peers. But as Arvind says, if we're not doing it properly, it's, it's, there's terrible risks. And it was a great question, Linda Gale, thank you. Um, we often get asked, you know, we've got a bit of money, can we train some peers? Um, and we always come back and say, but do you have money for the ongoing support, the mentorship, the supervision? And do you have money for building a system in which they will be supported? 
because otherwise, as I said, we set them up to fail. Um, they then get are unable to, to, to meet that incredible demand. And again, as Arvind said, they're seen as you know, cheap labor, quick fixes to reach those magic targets. Um, but also we, we need to be investing in their own health and well-being as well. So it's terribly worrying, particularly with all this you know, wonderful um, interest in mental health now and wonderful interest in peers. If, if, we, don't, if we aren't advocating for proper investment and I don't just mean financially, but in our systems and in our time and our energy and in, in doing this properly, then it, there are definite harms, yeah. Thanks. So I'm gonna to have to add something to that because uh, it, it's so incredibly important. Uh, I mean, our experience at Kuriskia Hospital in, in, in Cape Town has been exactly the same. So we do have a peer mentor program here, not only for adolescents living with HIV, but with, with multiple chronic illnesses. So we have mentors, who are living with diabetes, HIV, cancer, for example, and absolutely they, they are an incredibly valuable resource and they need to be conceptualized as such, but also a vulnerable resource. And, and we have ongoing weekly training and debriefing uh, with, with our mentors. Um, we, we originally started with, with the debriefing being spread, you know, quite a bit between, uh, you know, the sessions, like maybe once a month or twice a month. But, but actually it needs to be weekly, particularly for those that are really actively engaged and, and, doing, and doing this kind of on a, you know, on a, on a daily basis. Um, you know, they really are encountering other young people with really significant trauma and, and, and social issues. And yeah, ab absolutely. Thank you so much for that. muted. Um, there's a question from Linda Gale to Philip and Claire. How do we advocate for more resources for mental health issues? Sure. Um, so, and I see another question coming in too, so maybe I can speak to them both at the same time. And, and that's a very challenging question. I think, you know, if we, if we had the simple answer, it would, it would have been solved already. Um, and I just want to say fantastic presentations from both the panelists and incredible music as well. Um, and so, you know, thinking about an issue that Jackie and, and Arvine and, and Nicola all the, have talked about, this rising burden of mental health. And, you know, and thinking about this moment where mental health problems were rising globally before COVID, and, and now it's just, you know, worsened um, incredibly. And I think, Unfortunately, sometimes it takes these cat catastrophic moments to catalyze people to make changes and to try new things. Um, and so I think potentially the way the, this moment may call, we've seen across the media, you know, increased attention to mental health. The American Academy of Pediatrics just really put out a, you know, a news release pointing to the rise in mental health problems in the US, similar uh, programs and, and calls have been put out in South Africa that I've seen recently. And so I think you know it is these moments that that push us to to make changes, go into places that we potentially have been uncomfortable. And I think digital is a great example of this. So even just a few years ago, when I um, started working with the teams in Uganda, there were really no mental health services that could be accessed remotely. And COVID pushed uh, a group that I work with, like Strong Minds, to start providing telehealth therapy. Um, and, and, you know, go in a direction they hadn't gone before. And I, and I think uh, this would be something I'd love to hear Nicola talk more about. I, I know you gave a great overview of CAPS, but to hear about, you know, how that happened in the moment when you couldn't provide the same face-to-face -face services and how you've been able to offer telehealth services. So I think COVID and, and the way that mental health providers have been able to pivot to digital is a really great example of how a terrible catastrophe, these, these really challenging moments force us to make changes that could have positive implications. And specifically, when we think about uh, young people who, as you know, in the last We Move session, it was so, uh, it was highlighted that these communication devices, these fo our phones, the internet is where we can find these young people. So I'll pass it on. Claire, you've raised your hand. Yes, thanks, Jackie. And um, thanks, Linda Gale, for that question. Just thinking about advocacy, I think my initial thoughts are kind of around um, information that we don't have yet, 
relationships and people that we need to draw in, um, as well as the, the platforms we need to use. And, and first of all, when it comes to what we need to know, I mean, we don't even have national prevalence data on adolescent mental health problems in South Africa. Um, and we've only had one study in adults. And I think we really need to push for, we actually don't know the extent of the problem. Um, but as Philip said, with COVID, it's, it's become impossible to ignore mental health. So um, I think that has actually provided a bit of impetus. So that's around the information. There's so much we still need to know, but we do know there are a lot of effective interventions as we've highlighted today, but we need to know where to focus, you know, where to start. Um, and then when it comes to um, relationships and people, I think it's also about pitching up and saying the same thing. And, and um, sorry, so I think someone's unmuted. Um, okay, so, and then also thinking like, Prof. Catherine Sorsdahl has been working with the Department of Health for many, many years, and they've kind of got a really great working relationship. And now there's there's a whole lot of linkage with, linkages between public mental health and psychiatry and um, the Department of Health, and they've done a lot of um, work together. So I think that's really facilitated things. I think also NGOs, amazing NGOs like SADAG and Cake Mental Health. Um, and then the different platforms that we need to um, we need to be able to communicate with everyone. Um, so the one, the group that I actually really wants to highlight as jump to the platforms are the adolescents themselves, as, as Nicholas said. And um, as part of our research, we often do draw in adolescents. And I think for when it comes to advocacy, we need that quantitative data, the information, but I think the voices of the adolescents themselves are definitely key. Um, we are um, planning to set up an adolescent advisory board to kind of guide us on what to research and, and what to do. And I know Linda Gale, you and your team have, have been doing this for years. Um, so I really think that's key. And the different platforms, we need to be able to communicate with all different groups, um, digital platforms, social media, to other um, academics, if you're researchers, to clinicians, to NGOs, we need to all be communicating with each other. And I think be able to translate into each other's language, because um, I think that's, that is key. And um, yeah, there's some organizations like, and Nicola, I'm sure your organizations on Deary is great with this and the Friendship Bench as well in Zimbabwe with messaging on social media. And um, I know a lot of colleagues who do radio radio shows. And so I think there's, there's a lot that we can do and there's actually a lot going on, which is really heartening to see. I, I was really interested um in hearing about people's experiences with young people living in overcrowded areas um, and how they're able to use phones to engage with mental health professionals. We have struggled with some of our adolescents living with HIV. I mean, firstly, you know, sometimes they don't have their own phone and they're sharing their phones with other family members. The other thing is that is that often the reception is really bad. Never mind the not having data part. There's that. There's the fact that the data and data costs money. There's that bit. Then, of course, you may have data, but the cell reception in some of our informal settlements, townships, is is not great. Third thing is that often they're sharing phones with other family members, and and probably one of the most important issues is that they live in really overcrowded conditions where where privacy is a major issue. And in actual fact, uh, privacy is a privilege, uh, which many of our young people uh, living with HIV do not have. So Jackie, can I, uh, my hand is raised, I'm not sure if you can see it. Can. I was just wondering uh, to just to hear from Nicola and Philip about whether they've also, I see Claire's put in the chat box that she's faced, they face similar issues with telephone counseling and a chat box intervention as well. Definitely very challenging. I was just wondering if, if Philip and Nicola, you've yeah. come across similar issues before before we uh, go back to RV. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. And as soon as I finished speaking, I thought, you know, I, I present, I don't ever want to present digital as some kind of panacea to, to solve all of our problems. And, you know, in fact, uh, you mentioned social media and, and 
we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about, you know, the, neg the potentially negative impacts of social media on young people these days. Um, and I think that's another area we could, we could put pressure on these, you know, incredibly uh, powerful and massive companies to invest in mental health and infrastructure, right? That's one of the ways that people in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa often access the internet is like through Facebook Zero or WhatsApp. So we could, you know, put pressure on these companies to, to leverage their platforms to help people who maybe don't have ideal service. Um, and, I, and I completely agree. I don't think that the digital, it should replace or can replace in-person interactions. Um, I, I, I'm, one, I'm imagining what Arvin might be thinking. I'd love to hear from him, but I, he'd probably, I thought something along the lines of, you know, there's limited evidence or, you know, sporadic evidence to support these, um, this shift to digital because it's happened so quickly often during COVID. Um, but I do think that having this option for many people who would never have had the chance to reach a counselor is important. So yeah, I agree, we should temper it and, and, and it's important to raise these key limitations. Shall I add on Jackie? Sure, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And um, I, we, we were fortunate in that part of our package did, before COVID did involve this element of remaining connected and engaging with, with the young people between cats and their clients by phone for those that had phones. So when COVID entered our lives, um, really for us, it was a question of scaling that up. Um, and it was incredibly useful to have that foundation already, but there were a lot of things we still had to think through. And I'm gonna come back to that safety issue again. I think whilst the world is extremely excited about virtual technology um you know there are of course in extreme harms that could come from this as we all excitedly start sending messages um to young people and we as jack as, as you said jackie we don't know who has access to that phone we don't know what is going to happen in terms of um accidental disclosure about not just hiv status about gbv about anything um so i think as a community we should really be speaking out that whilst there's a huge excitement and definite role for, for virtual technology and digital technology, as Philip's saying, we need to really also be speaking out, out about the limitations or the implementation considerations and, and ethics of this so that it's done carefully and cautiously. Um, one approach we've been working on for several years is in a partnership with um, SHM Foundation and with Vive Healthcare is um, a an anonymous SMS based platform, which is facilitated by trained mentors. Um, and then young people can sign into this group anonymously. So, and, and we've actually found that they speak um, much more freely. Um, we're able to red flag part, you know, we leave them to get on the conversation, but we can also red flag particular issues that come up so that we can step in if, if people are at risk, but it is anonymous. It, it's another layer of, um, cost and facilitation, but that we're learning from that. And we're using that with um, adolescents in gen adolescents living with HIV in general, but also now with young young mothers living with HIV. So I think that there are there are definite definite benefits of this. And as Philip said, it's not. I think the point is we should be offering it as part of a package. We find it's very useful for young key populations who don't necessarily want to engage in the, in, in many of the ways other young people might, or young people that are mobile, that are crossing borders, um, caregivers. We're using it for caregivers of young people with high viral loads. So there are definite, definite values, but it isn't the panacea. You know, we need, it's a part of a package. Thanks. Yeah, and even the an anonymity brings with it its own complex ethical issues, because what do you do with a young person who says they're suicidal? Yeah, anyway, very complex. But thank, thank you for that. Ar Arvind, you, uh, you had your hand, hand raised. Oh, no, I've al already forgotten what I was going to say, but I, I want to talk, I want to refer to a couple of things. Um, I mean, I think, let me just comment quickly on the digital issues. And I think uh, Phil is absolutely right. Uh, I feel we haven't seen each other in a while. Um, just that, I think that digital, uh, the digital media has, has the potential for change. But the important question that, that arises again is, 
just having access to digital methods doesn't necessarily mean that you understand what is producing the change. And in throughout my presentation, the issue has always been not that there are not interventions that can work. It's the fact that we mount these huge interventions without really understanding what it is that we're trying to change. And the cost of those interventions then is not uh, insignificant. So it's important to understand, even within the context of um, uh, digital methods of interventions, what is, what is it that is producing the change that you seek to produce? Um, the second, I mean, I think just want to make a, an, another big plug for that. Um, I think systems level change and uh, a focus not only on uh, an HIV adolescent population, but on adolescents generally um, is to my mind, a much better approach to mental health than to sort of simply say, we need to actually improve uh, mental health of people living or affected by HIV AIDS, even though I know that their need is much greater. So if we want to, I mean, and, and the issue is here about opportunity. COVID has produced, given us an opportunity to actually inter intervene to enhance mental health among young people generally. And schools would be a, a fantastic uh, basis for mounting interventions that enhance mental health literacy, uh, that increase the attempts that uh, people might find that would be helpful to them. And in terms of prevention and just health promotion, a much better way to go. Um, so those are just the plugs I wanted to make. Thanks. Okay, I see your hand is raised, but, be, but before you start chatting, uh, would it be possible, we do have one more question um, on our menti.com um, for a poll. Uh, is it possible for you uh, to chat while that's happening, Claire? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, any chance, technical team, that we can launch into our last question while Claire's talking? Oh, let's go ahead, Claire. Um, thanks, Jackie. Just a bit of a reflection on the, the digital interventions. Um, it was quite interesting for us, I think just before COVID hit, we, we were busy. Um, we were um, looking at intervention. It was a WHO intervention um, using the chatbot. And, and we'd also um, started a, a counseling intervention that was face-to-face -face with young people. And it was, it was really interesting, obviously, having to go completely digital or telephonic. Um, it, was, it was really interesting to see some of the adolescents who we had recruited and who'd started the intervention face-to-face and then went over into telephonic counseling, we managed to retain them better than those who we started just telephonic. And I suppose it's not that surprising, but with the chatbot as well, we had an initial onboarding session face-to-face -face and built up a bit of a rapport. Um, sorry, Jackie, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just saying, yeah, I mean, it certainly, it's certainly from our clinical experience, you know, at, at the hospital in Curtis Care, is that it's 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 been harder to take on new adolescent patients we we haven't met um, via digital platforms versus people who we already have this kind of you know relationship with. We've met face to face, we know each other, they know us, and then the digital platform becomes a continuation of that relationship, yeah. as opposed to the way in which you establish that relationship. So yes, yeah. I mean. Uh, on the ground clinical perspective totally yeah. agree and and you know that that relational aspect in the beginning that kind of sense of am i a safe person uh, is so hard via via digital platforms uh, if that relationship is there then then it, it, it's okay to kind of like engage via via telephone or or zoom etc with somebody that you already know but it's it's hard to get a feel of, of somebody like this like we are now right i mean it's, it's actually really hard you know, we've heard each other's thoughts, but it really is, it's quite hard to sort of have a feel of each other um, in this kind of platform. And it certainly is missed not being able to, you know, engage with you guys face to face as well. It is sorely missed. Yeah, definitely. 
Thanks, Jackie. I wanted to make one more point just about the chatbot, which is really interesting. A lot of the kids kind of connected with the chatbot that we had to remind them a little bit that the chatbot was not a real person. But I think the nice thing about the chatbot was it was available all hours. I think we started just releasing little modules every few days, but then um, they wanted it to be able to access when they wanted it. So just be able to, if they were feeling really distressed for some reason, just to be able to access the breathing exercises or the audios, and they really appreciated that and be able to do a module, you know, even if it wasn't during working hours and a counselor wasn't available. So yeah, we obviously monitored that, but it was just lovely to see how they interacted with it and, and how they used it. And some kids felt like it was like a friend and some, some kids felt like it was the chatbot responded too quickly. So then they were kind of, it, it didn't feel right, the rhythm of the conversation. So anyway, it was just fascinating. Yeah, very interesting indeed. I mean, there, I suppose the kids that said, or the young people who felt that it responded too quickly kind of struggled with how it kind of inhuman it felt. It's really, really, really interesting. Yeah. But, so but we there's are, also even, yeah, sorry, I know, it, but there's, it's interesting just to put out there that, that at times there's even um, the impersonal aspect of the chat pot chatbot could be like help people feel comfortable disclosing and talk you know so there's some evidence out there for that as well but I think it's definitely contextual so I just thought that's an interesting little piece to add yeah there certainly is loads to learn about how to engage with young people um, via these new platforms uh, and both you know how you know whether what's done in high income countries is translatable to here um, guys Thank you everybody for a wonderful session uh, to the speakers, Arvine and Nicola, and to our panelists, Philip and Claire, and of course to the audience. Uh, thank you so, so much. And I hope you all have a magnificent day further. Bye-bye. Thanks, Decky. Thanks for, for Bye. hosting us. Yeah, Bye. thank you, wonderful. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks everyone.